uh, Jennifer Kushner, Dr. Jennifer Kushner. She is the director of CALS Global at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she leads and supports all of the international engagement in agriculture and the life sciences for the university. But prior to joining Cal, she was a state specialist with the, with the University of Wisconsin from 20, uh, 2007 to 2018. And for the past 30 years, hard to believe, looking at you, Jen, 30 years, uh, she led and evaluated US-based and global initiatives related to agriculture, environment, and health. She specializes in systems approaches to complex issues um, with some really focused work on water. She is also, one of our longest standing collaborators and one of our dearest friends. She's smart, she's amazing. I am sure you will enjoy her talk. So without delay, Jen, I will pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Laura. And I am going to screen share here. Give me one sec. All right, and I will uh, <clears throat> reintroduce myself just briefly. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I am really delighted to be here and to talk about systems thinking in the context of global grand challenges. My name is Jennifer Kushner, and I'm the director of a global research and partnerships office at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, as Laura shared. Our office is focused on what we call 5I partnerships and projects. So 5I it stands for international, interdisciplinary, inclusive, integrated, and innovative. So I'd like to start with a short story. One day last week, I had three meetings with three different men from three different countries. They were three very different conversations, <laughs> but they did share a key message. And the key message was, I just want to help my country feed and take care of itself. What came to mind were the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, quote, how can we use the accumulated, accumulated wisdom of the world for the development of full human power? And to address, quote, problems that plague humanity as a whole, end quote. It came to mind because, uh, and I was on my way home when I was reflecting on this day with the three men, with the three different conversations and the same message. I was reflecting on W.E.B. Du Bois um, quotes because I really believe as a global community, we have the potential for each country, not only to feed and take care of itself, but to help each other do the same. So for a brief background, I wanna go back to an earlier point in my career when I was working as a senior program development and evaluation specialist at a top tier US university, which is University of Wisconsin. <laughs> So in this role, I was often asked to measure the impact from large investments over a very diverse portfolio of change efforts focused on major societal and planetary problems. So take your pick, there were a lot of them. The situations in that role that really caught my attention were the ones with low return on investment or ROI. And these were ones where a lot of effort or investment was being made, but the needle really hadn't moved very far in terms of the desired change in addressing the complex issue. I was especially drawn to well-designed but low ROI programs. So, you know, some ROI, so some low performing uh, programs aren't that well designed. I was drawn to ones that I thought were really well designed, but just uh, were not performing very well. And ones that uh, really focus on pressing societal issues. Based on my work, I really concluded that the problem was not with our content expertise, our resources, or our technologies, although certainly improvements can always be made in all of those 
but in two other things, in our approaches and how we were thinking about the problems. No surprise there. I had a hunch that the solution rested in multiplicity and being able to envision and employ a systems approach at all levels of scale. At the time, I was leading several national and international projects related to water, as Laura mentioned. Those focused on teaching systems thinking to water professionals, helping them use systems thinking in their work, and modeling systems approaches to program or strategy development. And while we worked really hard with governments and industries and nonprofits and academia and others <laughs> to build networks and nations of systems thinkers, and while the people that we touched really did start to think differently about water, I struggled with how isolated and singular the efforts still seemed in terms of moving the needle on major water problems. So I began to look for models. Oops, go back. Sorry. I began to look for models and leaders, and I looked closely at leaders like the 2004 Nobel Peace Laureate, the late Professor Wangari Mathai, who was recognized for bringing about large scale environmental, social, economic, and political change in ways that were highly integrated and mutually reinforcing. Uh, Professor Mathai was an activist, a scientist, a mother, um, many things. Um, but at the core of her leadership and ultimately her impact was a deep understanding that people needed to think differently about the problems. And she centered education in the mission of her movement, which um, was called the Green Belt Movement. The brilliance of her leadership and what the Nobel Committee recognized her for was the collective impact of her efforts across social, environmental, economic, and political domains. So increasingly, my interest became focused on change at scale, and I looked for ways to apply systems thinking to grand challenges in ways that would allow actors to address them more robustly and more quickly. And I will say her work spanned, uh, you know, it, it was not quick, but it was um, an incredible model. In 2011, I was introduced to Kanya and Kramer's collective impact white paper in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. For those who are not familiar with the framework, um, it grew out of frustration by major funders with a lack of system-wide progress in education reform, despite really important local um, or individual achievements, really due to the scale and complexity of the US public education system. The authors went on to examine and learn from a success story, which really became the, the basis of the framework. Collective impact is a framework fundamentally grounded in notions of multiplicity. So more than one, not singular, not once, but ongoing. That's what I mean by multiplicity. There are five core conditions for collective impact. And I've highlighted the pieces that I think are most pertinent to the notion of multiplicity, which will connect with systems thinking. And that is, a common agenda, not a singular agenda, but a, sh a common agenda, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and so on. So we're gonna look uh, briefly at each of these, um, not get into great depth, uh, but basically what the collective impact framework tells us is that we need to work together in specific ways to achieve more robust results than we could do alone. Probably not news to anybody here. According to Kanye and Kramer and the others who followed, and there's been a lot of um, work since their original 2011 paper, um, the approach to achieve collective impact was clear 
but what was less clear was how to do each element. And I realized that systems thinking offered the path toward implementation, and I really set off to marry collective impact with systems thinking. So let's start with a common agenda. Global grand challenges are the complex, hard, seemingly intractable problems facing humanity and the planet. These include things like climate change, inequality, population growth, et cetera, fill in the blank. And today, a framework really growing in popularity um, are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So those are the UN SDGs or the SDGs for short. These goals are framed in outcome language. So for example, no poverty rather than as grand challenges. But in essence, those are just different perspectives on the same thing. In this case, poverty. They're framed as no poverty, but at the end of the day, the grand challenge is poverty. The framework is not universal, but it moves in the direction of a common agenda around issues that pose challenges to humanity and the planet. I'd like to use these briefly as an illustration for how we could magnify our impact, our collective impact, by applying systems thinking within the collective impact frame. So the UN SDGs represent a shared set of commitments to bring about change. What they offer is an articulation of key ideas, distilled ideas, as distinctions that are grouped together essentially as being parts of an international common agenda for sustainable development. Not completely universal, but common. What they do not offer and what we have not advanced sufficiently um, from my pers perspective through policy or funding strategy are more detailed agendas that articulate the relationships, perspectives, systems, and further distinctions amongst and between them. A common agenda is built and evolved using systems, a common agenda built and evolved using systems thinking would look more like a system of systems. I'll share an example of a collective impact approach that's just getting started, but may offer some insights. So last year, a North American network of the Association of Public Land Grant Universities called the International Committee on Organization and Policy, that's the group, came together to build out a common agenda for engaging in global agriculture. To create it, we engaged stakeholders across North America, and we mapped their ideas into what became a roadmap called Feeding the World, for short. And while all the SDGs are relevant to what the network generated through the process. The agenda, the common agenda, came to really focus on top priorities and linked sustainable development goals two, three, 11, and 13 from the perspective of diverse stakeholders in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. We did not frame our work directly in STG language, but the concepts align. The common agenda included research, education, and outreach within academia, government, and industry, and the nonprofit sector, and focused on climate, food nutrition security, sustainability, and One Health. So the next element, shared measurement. <clears throat> So to build out, excuse me, <clears throat> to build out a system of shared measurement really requires that it's intimately coupled with the common agenda. That might seem obvious, but it's <clears throat> um, amazing how infrequently those two things go together um, at the local scale with a program and its evaluation or in a collective impact approach with the common agenda and shared measurement. A common agenda and its related system of measurement fundamentally are mental models that can be built and should be evolved over time based on data, evidence of what works and what does not. A system for shared measurement does not mean that every collective impact 
collaborator needs to measure exactly the same things. It does not mean that. Although identifying shared indicators, shared metrics, and methods can be helpful in aggregating results, what it does mean is that we need to build a commons of connected evidence where one set of results can be better understood in relation to the evidence it's with. I'm sorry if this is a little bit blurry, <clears throat> but I'm gonna talk you through it. <clears throat> so, and this is an illustration. So um, the Cabreras and I have a chapter in the Rutledge Handbook of Systems Thinking, <clears throat> um, in which we lay out a framework for systems evaluation and which I will not go into much today, but I would encourage you to take a look at it because it, it's a deeper dive. But in it, we posit that we need to start looking at our programs in relation to each other and as part of larger systems of programs. If we do, we can draw on the work of others, saving resources and learning more quickly what works. If we wanna measure change, we need to focus on the full equation, meaning programs. So in the case of this particular slide, replace the word treatment with programs or organizations or whatever. <clears throat> in relation to outcomes. The glue between these is evidence. So in a collective impact approach, we wanna build a body of evidence for what works and we need to include all that we can to find what is relevant. So back to our North American roadmap example, feeding the world, <clears throat> developing a shared system of measurement involves pulling together the key related programs and outcomes of North American collective impact collaborators into a map as illustrated. This is not our map. This is just a very simple illustration. For example, as we look to measure impact related to One Health, which is one of the priorities, we can map the programs of various leaders in this area, such as Colorado State University or the University of Wisconsin. Or we might look to how Dalhousie University in Canada, the University of Arizona, and Universidad de Guadalajara in Mexico are measuring impact related to sustainability. Building shared measurement starts with a system map and a shared mental model of the existing body of knowledge and key gaps. From there, it includes agreeing on and Share, sorry, agreeing on shared and mutually reinforcing, re, re, mutually reinforcing approaches to evaluation, including some shared indicators and metrics. So that's really not the most important thing. Moving on, um, mutually reinforcing activities. <clears throat> so mutually reinforcing activities or MRA, <laughs> of course, for short, <clears throat> is a profound idea that is at the heart of a systems approach to change and toward addressing global grand challenges. <clears throat> in essence, what MRI says is that in a collective impact approach, each, collabor each collaborator should do its distinct thing with a deep understanding of the expertise, niche, contribution of the others, and to do its own thing in ways that mutually reinforce the others. This is the one thing in collective impact that we do the least well, and I believe may have the greatest potential for scaling, scaling of efforts and leading to efficiencies. There are lots of ways to do this, creating a visual map. Um, it might be a theory of change map or a roadmap um, is a really an important way and an a valuable way to articulate how different programs, organizations, or even countries, as in our case, or all of those, as in our case, can work together to bring about collective impact in areas of shared interest. So back to our example with the Feeding the World Roadmap, the backbone organization, which is the International Committee on Organization and Policy of APLU, conducted a survey, hosted a convening summit, held personal conversations with collective impact collaborators in all three countries, along with a variety of other strategies, really with the intent to deeply understand each other better. We were explicit in naming how we intended to complement, enhance, and build on each other's efforts across countries, institutions, and areas of expertise. 
To do this, we needed to know each collaborator's distinct identity and niche, their socio-political perspectives, the nature of relationships between them, and a lot more. And we needed that in order to know how to best mutually reinforce each other. A few of the specific ways we approached this were to develop a multilateral strategy with, or we're developing a multilateral strategy with advocacy and funding partners um, together around the common agenda and each country's strengths, focusing and allowing for those strengths, fostering exchange and sharing in order to build deeper understanding of each other, sharing data and strengthening the participation of marginalized scientific communities. Those are just a few of the ways that we've started to build out the MRA. Continuous communication, um, another element. So back to the sustainable development goals as an example of a common agenda. Goal number 17 is called partnerships for the goals. And in a way it's a bit different than all of the other uh, goals um, in that it uh, seems very foundational. Within the uh, collective impact framework, continuous communication and backbone support are essential for maintaining partnerships. Continuous com communication is about establishing shared tools and processes for sharing information and learning. I really want to emphasize in learning. As a complex adaptive system, a, a CI initiative, a collective impact initiative, depends on real-time feedback to adapt efficiently to changing conditions. So in our example, the Feeding the World map, the network established several ways to accomplish continuous communication, including uh, communique, which is um, a messaging strategy, newsletter type strategy, regular meetings, a variety of communication tools, data repository, and all that grounded in a shared mental model of how the group wanted continuous communication to occur and from the perspective of regularly and consistently soliciting feedback about how the common agenda was going and what was our shared measurement telling us and being able to adapt that and evolve it in real time. The last element uh, of the collective impact frame is backbone support. Um, and this is actually a picture of uh, the roadmap, um, one, one picture of the roadmap, I should say. Um, so within, within the collective impact framework, coordination and consistency for effort should be provided to facilitate uh, the implementation. In some cases, that support really rests with a single organization. And in other cases, it can be distributed or located within another type of structure. In a way, the structure doesn't matter, it's the function. Backbone support, importantly, is different than leadership. It has to do with maintaining, like I said, support and coordination for the functions of the collective. So in our example of Feeding the World Roadmap, um, ICOP, the International Committee on Organization Policy, agreed to serve as that backbone. It is a network uh, uh, across North America um, and, and across diverse institutions. And so far, it's really focused on coordination and integration across all components of the roadmap and facilitating that MRA, mutually reinforcing activities, as a core function. It does not mean that ICOP is leading everything, not at all. It, it just provides the structure and support activities that work across all of the collective impact collaborators. So what's needed moving forward? I think as evidenced by this conference and this gathering, there's a global movement afoot to strengthen our capacities as systems thinkers, leaders, and agents of change, clearly. Um, thinking about global grand challenges together can happen while addressing them together. But to do that, we need to demand and create more opportunities to achieve collective impact. There's a lot that we do that on the surface presents like collective impact, but it doesn't have systems thinking behind it, and therefore it really doesn't play out as intended with collective impact. 
The collective impact approach can be the basis for organization plans, policy, and funding initiatives, and a lot more. So I'd like to conclude by offering five actions for marrying systems thinking with collective impact and for engaging this these in together in service of grand challenges. Number one, encourage and employ systems thinking and mapping for building our common agendas. A list of priorities, activities, and all other linear approaches that we use don't help us see and share understandings in all the ways that we know. Funders and policymakers can ask for this and agents of change can deliver it. Number two, build a commons of evidence that is a systems-based commons related to grand challenges. We have lots of facts available to us, but how are they related? What builds on what? We want to center feedback and evidence in the equation of program evaluation and shared measurement. Number three, when embarking on a collective impact effort with collaborators, be very intentional and develop strategies to deeply understand each other, listen, and how the work of each enhances and reinforces the work of the other. Don't duplicate unless there's a purpose. Seek and value diversity in your collective. Number four, center learning as a key purpose for communication. Yes, there is task function focused sharing that's needed but systems will be most adaptive and resilient the faster they learn, including a collective impact cast. Lastly, identify what is needed as a backbone to hold it all together and agree on who and how that support will be provided. Revisit this regularly and don't confuse it with leadership. We really need to move swiftly, efficiently, and with high ROI, return on investment. I know we can solve our grand challenges by doing better as uh, go back to W.E.D. Du Bois by using the accumulated wisdom of the world for the development of full human power and to address problems that plague humanity as a whole by marrying collective impact and systems thinking. So thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a good talk. Um, not surprisingly, we have a bunch of questions coming in for you. Um, Jen, so I'm just going to start and we'll see, hopefully we can get through most of them in the 20 minutes or so that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the first question, um, they're wondering if you can elaborate on the relationship between low tech solutions, which include using local non-formally educated self-determined labor and naturally occurring or discarded materials and high tech systems that depend on non-local and professional know-how employing sort of manufactured expensive devices like can you tell say a little bit more about the difference between them and, and why that's important yeah i mean i think back to my um my comment that mutually reinforcing activities is fundamentally the most under engaged component of collective impact i think this is a great illustration so we have these sticky problems that really warrant different um, different levels of scale, different level, incredible diversity to um, bring forward solutions. So, if there are high tech problems, or there there are problems that can be solved by high tech, that voice is needed at the table. Equally, if the problem is an everyday problem that's happening in the field out behind and, you know, a thousand local peasants are dealing with that problem, that that voice needs to be at the table. And MRA basically says, we're coming together around this common agenda and we need to deeply understand the different dimensions if we map it out and we articulate those different perspectives and distinctions, et cetera, for what, what is the problem. It's much easier to see how those um, contributions fit. They're not, it's not that each voice addresses the whole, they have a niche, they have a unique contribution. And so it's really, um, you know, deeply to understanding what the problem is and then different expertise that can come to the table with incredible diversity. I'm not sure quite if I'm answering the question, but to answer the question about relationships, they're both important and they, they need to be at the table in, in many, many instances. 
Yeah. It sounds like, it sounds like what you're saying is the decision on low tech versus high tech is very much dependent on how the problem presents itself. Meaning maybe it's a mixture of both. We're not going to choose between one or the other. It's going to be whatever, whatever fits the situation as it presents itself. Yeah. I mean, if, um, water scarcity is the problem, um, and there's, there are a lot of pain points with water scarcity and that is affecting, you know, local, uh, low tech, uh, living and application, that perspective is important. Meanwhile, incredible scientific innovation and advancement can help. We need both of those voices at the table in a common agenda around water scarcity. Right. Yeah. Um, that's great. And another question uh, comes in about um, MRAs and uh, I'm going to sort of read it and let you kind of, it's kind of a tough question. So I'll have you like take okay. it, in. but yeah, yeah. it's how do you create mutual reinforcing activities when the reality for some of the stakeholders is physical survival, like Congolese refugees and the important issues for the other stakeholders are maybe more theoretic, more theoretical or you not as valid or something like that. How do you reconcile those two different um, uh, perspectives and what's at stake for the different stakeholders if they're so different? Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, anybody who's affected by the problem, their voice is important to the solution. Right. And that doesn't mean um, that everybody's workload is the same. What it means is that all of the voices, all of the perspectives are important. If somebody's struggling for their life, you know, they're not gonna have any bandwidth or sense of safety or whatever necessarily. But there are lots of organizations that advocate on behalf of that population. There are community leaders. There are ways to, um, bring that perspective to the table without it adding burden to an already burdened person. And so it's not about everybody's workload is the same. The idea with mutually reinforcing activities is to say, um, anybody that's touched by a grand challenge, any of the, the where that where that impact is, we, we need their, we need input perspective or understanding, um, and we need to do our thing in a way that doesn't make the burden harder, but, but can help. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. great. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, another person in the audience is looking for a little bit of clarification on collective impact as an idea. So they're asking, is this an approach to orchestrate collective action with a shared goal? Or is it to move forward when there are conflicting views among the actors or stakeholders that are engaged in the problem? Yeah, that's a great question. Maybe some of both. Who knows? Yeah, that's a great question. And I also I realized I should probably make a distinction, which is there is a formally recognized framework that was um, big C, big I, that was created by and for, first put forward through Stanford Social Innovation Review. There's also an idea that's called collective impact, which, um, and I'm making that distinction maybe for two reasons. So in the original, and, and since 2011, there's been a lot of scholarship and a lot of um, practice around big C, big I. Um, in the original um, positioning of that framework, the introduction of it and the early work was very grounded in a group of actors coming together around something they were trying to move the needle on together in common. So we'll go back to the public um, reform in the public um, education system in the United States. Mm -hmm. However, um, small c, small i, so getting together a group of people to try to find um, common ground, uh, that term collective impact can be used for a range of processes and approaches to do that. And I don't think of it as either or. Um, you know, I think that there, 
the approaches would be different. So if you've already know you've got a common agenda around something, um, that might be your starting point. And I will I will say almost always there will be difference that that presents itself shortly after that. So get a group of people together that that think they're going to work to address the public uh, reform in the public education, and they think they've got a common agenda, and start moving down a road. And all of those differences will present themselves because it's a group of people, or organizations, or countries, or whatever. So, um, really, the the framework, the intent of the framework is to say. Um, we're not going to move the needle on big things if we don't work together. Right. And uh, that's not, again, not to say there aren't like incredible discoveries and achievements that do incredible things. But on these complex societal and planetary problems, we need all the evidence and all the knowledge to working together. And there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, and having people come together um, is important. Yeah, no, that makes great sense. So another um, another question is about um, how. So you you've done a lot, you've done a lot of impressive work in these sort of global arenas around a lot of things for a long time. I know this. I've seen it. Um, and I guess what people are wondering is, from your perspective, how would you suggest that we spread these sort of systems approaches? Um, to sort of better impact groups like this and to get it sort of more into practice and the conversation around um, all of this collective impact. How would yeah. you suggest that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it was it was in my sort of five actions at the end. I think we, we, as systems thinkers, we bring this to what we're doing. If we're writing a grant, we we pitch we pitch a collective impact frame and it's grounded in a systems thinking approach. If we're in a position to implement or fund or lead things, we put it out there as, as a, an approach and we use everything we know about systems thinking, the tools, the resources, the community, the expertise that's here in the room to um, make the collective impact really be a system of systems approach. Yeah. Yeah, and and so I think we just marry those things wherever we are when we when we're trying to address some sticky issue together, and we and um, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, maybe three. We'll see. But um, one of the things that. Um, somebody was wondering is, could you give an example of a specific project, in particular, if it was with uh, Dr. Palta, um, that was really <laughs> an, an illustration of, you know, just to get an idea of a concrete example of a project that you worked in where you really embodied or embedded these ideas of collective impact and what, what the results were and what, and what maybe why those results were different had you not had the collective impact kind of perspective. Yeah. Um... So Dr. Pulta and I did not overlap um, a lot in our roles before he retired, I will um, say that. Um, but to, to an example, um, you know, I think uh, the work that, uh, Laura, you'll be familiar with, the work that we did with, with Think Water um, would be a good illustration. And what that was, was a national uh, USDA funded project that uh, really strove to um, that our common agenda was to uh, build a nation of systems thinkers. That was our that was our common agenda. Was our vision and our shared measurement. Um, and so we, you know, there's a history to how we came to that, but. It was the pain. It was the pain point. It was one of those examples where um, we kept hearing, you know, where there's a lot of investments going to moving the needle on water, and the needle isn't moving. <laughs> and it was one of those where we thought, okay, we can do something different here. And um, 
set out to measure um, to really try to build a, a commons of evidence around and, and connect what we knew around uh, teaching and learning and applying systems thinking, not necessarily in the context of water. We, we drew from everything that we knew to build that commons and some of it included water and some of it did not include water. Our MRA approach was to work with local governments, nonprofits, um, other le higher level governments, uh, public school systems, municipalities, uh, industry, diverse portfolio, and really deeply try to understand what they were bringing to the table and to build a robust approach that enabled them to do what they were doing better with water um, to help the funders of water programs fund things better, to help educators educate better, to help policy people do that better, um, and to evolve uh, to, to evolve our effort based on continuous communication uh, and feedback. Um, wow. And the the backbone organization was our collective impact leadership team, if you will. We so we were sort of spread out across the country, but. Yeah, that's great. Well, actually building off of what you just said, we have two questions that sort of, I think we're trying to situate or contrast what you're talking about with sort of existing practices. Sure. So one of the questions um, was, could you expand a little bit on the difference or the relationship between con continuous communication and organizational learning? Like yeah. how do those two work yeah, together? Yeah. yeah, I think, um, so continuous communication from the perspective of, of a collective impact um, framework uh, ultimately should be used to advance organizational learning, but there are other functions. So there's there's this idea of a backbone, right? So you've got a diverse, you've got a cast, you've got a, a complex adaptive system, you've got a diverse group of actors, collaborators, that have come together around a, a common agenda and are doing a bunch of diverse things, hopefully in mutually reinforcing ways. Continuous communication in that framework is, is about ensuring that those, all of the functions within the collective impact are, are actually mutually reinforcing. So not just the actors are mutually enforcing, but like the, the elements of collective, that the common agenda is reinforcing, the shared measurement is reinforcing um the communication etc but the way a collective impact moves adjusts quickly and timely is by um having real quick real time feedback from what's happening across the diversity of actors and so if that feedback and that communication so the continuous communication says it needs to happen you need a, a way for it to happen. You need a set of ways for it to happen. It includes some like day-to-day -day tasky things that you know relate to the organizational functioning and capacity. And oh, by the way, you need to use that. You need to have it happening um, regularly. The use of that feedback about how things are going is where it starts to sort of you know, think of a relay race moves into the organizational learning. What do you do with that information? How does that feed back into the, the common agenda? What does that mean for what you might be measuring differently? So um, in the in the CI frame, commun continuous communication um, needs to inform organizational learning, but it includes some other um, functions as well. That's great. That's great. Well, sadly, we are running out of time. I'm getting a cue from the external environment, some feedback that it's time to introduce <laughs> the speaker. So um, I will thank you very much for your very informative and interesting session.